So we don't have the, the cheat sheets behind me here. So you'll have to open your, your Bibles or use your phone or whatever you happen to use. Uh, there are some Bibles at the back. Lillian can pass out if you don't have one and you'd like to follow along. We are turning to Ephesians chapter 4 is where we'll be looking today. The latter half of chapter 4. We're starting at verse 25. And you'll see in your bulletin, the title we're looking at, uh, I thought was pretty fun, is Don't Just Don't, Also Do. So if you can figure out what that means through some tongue twister way, um, that's what we're looking at. Um, but I'd like to start us out with a question. What are you known for? When someone thinks about you or when someone meets you for the first time, or when someone hears about you in the community, what is the first way they choose to describe you if no one knows your name? They say, let's pick uh, Jim Bruce. You say, Jim Bruce, and they don't know who you are. You go, no, you know that fellow that lives on that place, or works with the cows, or whatever way they choose to describe you. What is the thing that you're known for? For me, oftentimes, it's the fact that I'm a pastor, and I have a, a ponytail. Today, I don't, but... I have long hair anyway. And when they say, oh, it's so-and-so pastor from such-and-such -such church, Pastor Daniel, and people go, who is that? Oh, the pastor with the ponytail. All of a sudden, everyone knows who you're talking about. So there's certain indicators. There's certain things that we, we can become known for. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Some of them are in between, like having long hair. It's just something, something fun to have people known by. Um... My wife, on the other hand, sometimes is known for her smelly feet. It's good to say when she's not here. At least, at least growing up, growing up, she does my, her. She there's this spray that her mom had. She's always spraying in her shoes and go. I don't know why no one else has to have this in their shoes, but when I walk by the shoe rack, and it, it's just the smell. I got to get the spray out and spray the shoes. And I don't know why your feet are so bad, but that's just the way they are. Um, so, so to her mom, anyway, she was known for her her smelly feet. Each one of us maybe have funny things we're known for. Maybe we have good things we're known for. Maybe we have bad things we're known for. But we all have something that we're known for. And the question then is, what is the church known for? Not necessarily this specific church or any specific church, but the church as a whole. What are we known for? I think there's many things we can be known for in one way or another. But the one thing that stands out to me is the words, thou shalt not. If you have someone who is outside of a church, who's thinking about church and has no experience with church, and they hear the words church, sometimes they think, well, those are the people who say you should do such and such and such. They're the, the Ten Commandments followers, um, or whatever it might be. And why is that? Because that's the easiest thing to communicate, and it's also the easiest thing for, for the outsider to see. If you think about parenting, it's easier to punish bad behavior than it is to teach good behavior. Because you see the behavior, and you need to correct it right away. My son has issues with, uh, with biting when he doesn't get his way or when something is frustrating him. And so in that moment, we have to stop him from biting his brother or whatever it might be, because that is not an appropriate way to respond to something and you're going to hurt someone, right? So that's a negative thing that we need to punish immediately. And that's easy to see, that's easy to address, that's easy to deal with. But I think we need to balance that well with also promoting or encouraging good behavior. I've heard this, I'm sure you've heard this, someone maybe says, stop hitting your brother, just be good, right? But why do we have to tag that on at the end? Because right now you're being bad, so just stop it and be good. Well, the problem is we're not defining what it means to be good. So what the kid is now uh, learning is that if I don't hit my brother, that means I'm being good. So to be good is the opposite of to be bad, but it's not really well defined. 
it's not a thing that I can do to be good. It's just a thing that I have to stop doing in order to be good. You see where this is going? This can happen within the church. How do you be good? When you stop sinning. Well, how do you do that? Well, here's all the sins, and if you don't do them, then you're good, right? How do you be a good child? Well, you stop doing all the things mom and dad tell you not to do, and then you're a good child. It, it translates in all sorts of different categories. But instead of this, and this is something I try to do intentionally, and it has to be intentional. It's something you have to work at because it's not normal and natural. The easy thing is to tell someone, stop doing the bad, and then we're okay. But then you're just sort of in the middle. I think what we need to do is encourage and praise good behavior. For instance, uh, as a child, this is probably an older child, helps with the chores. And we praise them for that, and they enc we encourage them to do that. And if they're, they do it without you asking them, then remember to encourage them on that. Because now you're saying, this is a good behavior, and I want to let you know. This is what it means to be good, to do this good thing. It doesn't only mean to not do the bad things. Or maybe to have good manners. Well, that's a good thing. Thank you for asking appropriately for something. Right? Or maybe we're praising them for sharing. This is easier for, for younger kids who need to learn to share their toys. We don't tell them, stop not sharing your toys. We tell them to share their toys. And when they do, that's a good behavior. So we want to recognize that and praise you for that. So again, it's a balance. We can't only praise the good behavior and ignore the bad behavior. We can't only punish the bad behavior and ignore the good behavior. You need to have both. But it's harder to do the second because we have to be intentional about it. They say the hardest way to break a bad habit is simply to tell someone to stop doing it. Have you heard that before? So it's interesting when we look at the way we sort of run or gauge how we do things in the church regarding sin or how we do things regarding our children that we're trying to get rid of the bad behavior and the way that we choose to do it more often than not is by just saying stop doing that it's useful in the moment but it's not extraordinarily useful in the long there's a verse in romans 5 verse 20 it says the law came so that sin might increase it's an interesting verse so we have this law, we have the things we should be doing, and as we meditate on the law and as we think about the law, all it points to is all the things that we need to stop doing, right? And so we think about these things, I really shouldn't do this, I really shouldn't do that. And when you're tempted to do that, you say, I really shouldn't do that. And now what are you thinking about? The thing you shouldn't be doing. So what are you more tempted to do now? The thing you shouldn't be doing. Uh, I, the, the way this was explained to me once is very interesting. He says... Now, what if I tell you to stop thinking of pink elephants? What did you just picture in your mind? A pink elephant. Were you picturing that before? Absolutely not. But now the law has come, you now realize I shouldn't be thinking of pink elephants, right? He says, now if I tell you again, stop thinking of pink elephants. What did you just think of again? Even if you just forgot two seconds ago, you're now picturing a pink elephant. And then if I put a picture of a pink elephant on the screen and tell you stop picturing pink elephant. What are you picturing? A pink elephant. There's no way around it. Even though you know you shouldn't be picturing a pink elephant, you happen to be thinking of one. That's just the way it happens to work. And I think oftentimes when we try to deal with sin in our own lives, we know the sin or we know the temptation. And in that moment, what do we choose to do? We tell ourselves, stop, stop thinking this, stop doing this, stop whatever. And we think we're trying to be effective and it just seems to be getting worse. And I think this is what creates uh, sort of sin patterns, or not what creates, what perpetuates sinful patterns. When we have a sinful pattern, and the only way we know how to get away from it is to sort of beat ourselves up about it and hope that that will help. That's usually the way we deal with it, even if we know this is the case or not. So the question is, what is a better way to address it? How do we keep this in balance with stop doing the bad, but also do the good? I want to have some audience participation now. Think of something that's a bad habit, whether it be one that you have, whether it be one that someone else you know has, whether it be just one in general. Think of a, a bad habit. What's a bad habit? Procrastination. There we go. So we'll take that one, procrastination. So 
let's try and think of something that can replace procrastination. Instead of telling yourself, stop procrastinating, what can we do when we're tempted to procrastinate in order to stop procrastinating? Something to replace it with. <laughs> Make a list. Wonderful. Wonderful. And now you're more motivated to do the things. You can have a track. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Something else. Another bad habit. <clears throat> Being late. Right. So when you show up to your meeting and you say, oh, I'm always late, or you beat yourself up on the way there going, oh, why am I so late all the time? Not necessarily effective. So the question is, when you're going to go to a meeting that you know you're probably going to be late to because that's your tendency, that's your temptation, what can we do in that moment to replace perpetually being late? <laughs> There you go. There you go. There you go. Let's pick a fun one. Um, eating too much junk food could be a, a bad habit. So what can we do to replace that bad habit? Don't buy it. Yeah. What if you've already bought it? Throw in the garbage. I was thinking, go to the gym. Go for a jog. Get out of the house away from it, but also do the opposite of what eating the junk food would have done for you. Right? Um, and I think oftentimes, when we're dealing with these things that we're tempted to do, they are addressing a certain need or a certain perceived need in our life. And oftentimes what we actually need is to do the opposite. To get as far away from the situation, as far away from the thing as possible. Because why, why for instance, why does a fat person eat so much junk food? Because they feel horrible about their body. And they're trying to cover it up with eating junk to make them feel better. That's actually making the situation worse. What they actually need is to go to the gym. They don't want to do it. But that's what they actually need, right? So that's one example. I'm not saying every fat person eats a lot of junk food and doesn't exercise. That's a, a broad stroke. But that's an example, right? Of a thing that we can be stuck in, that we, we sort of keep doing because we don't know any other way to do it. And sometimes we need to sort of flip the cards around and make ourselves a bit uncomfortable and say, I need to go the other way and not just stop doing this, but start doing this other thing. Because that is actually how you break bad habits. By not just stopping the bad habit, but by replacing the bad habit with a good habit. And it's far more effective if it's a good habit that is the entire opposite of what the bad habit was. Because you're so far divorced from that, and so far into this, that the temptation is less to go that far into the bad, back to that bad habit. Um, I'm sure we can think of examples all the time here. But I think Jesus wants to lead us into a life that is better, that is more full, that is more alive, that is not simply a life that is lacking more bad habits than it used to be before we became Christian. I think there's more to it than that. The last number of weeks, we've been talking about sin. We've been addressing sin. We've sort of, what is sin? How does it work? What does it look like? What does it mean to be tempted? All these different things that we've been tackling in different, in different ways. This is how to get rid of those. This is the way of getting rid of those bad habits. Identifying the bad habit, knowing what it is. That's the first step. These are the things that are holding us back. These are the things that are weighing us down. These are the sins in our lives. But as we work on these things in our lives, it's important to do what I'd like to call replacement therapy. To not just recognize the sin and tell ourselves, well, I need to stop doing that now that I know it's a problem. But to actually replace that tendency with something entirely different and new and fresh that will add to our life. Instead of just taking things away until we feel like 
like the classic example, God just doesn't want you to have any fun, right? He wants to take away all the bad things and leave you with nothing to do. Well, I think he actually wants to replace those with something that's far better for you to do, far more healthy for you to progress with. And it will enhance our relationship with ourselves, will enhance our relationship with God and with each other as we engage with these things, because sin oftentimes drives a wedge in those things. Whether it be a wedge in our own lives, feeling horrible about ourselves because we did this thing we know we shouldn't be doing. Whether it be driving a wedge, let's say, between a husband and a wife. Adultery is really good at doing that. Um, driving a wedge between you and God where you just feel like maybe you can't go to God with certain things or you have a, a, a warped concept of God because of this sort of way you're engaged in something. There's all these things that sin oftentimes will drive a wedge within relationships. Um, if you gossip about someone, pick another example, it will drive a wedge in your relationship with that person, right? So I want to go through Ephesians chapter 4 here that we talked about. And this is an interesting passage because it's talking about relationships and how we should relate with each other in, in context of the body of Christ. But it's also mentioning sins or mentioning things that we shouldn't be doing within our relationships and then replacing those things with the opposite. So we'll see how that kind of works. This is sort of a, a picture of replacement theology or replacement therapy here. Ephesians 4.25 says, Put away falsehood. Let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. So we know the sin, the falsehood, the lying. Put that away. Get rid of that. It, it, dri it drives a wedge in your relationship between you and that person you're lying to or that person you're lying about. This is not a healthy pattern to have. This is a sin. Get rid of it. This is easy to find in a small town. It's full of gossip or lying about your neighbor or lying about yourself. And it's easily found out, isn't it? Because word gets around that so-and-so said such and such. And before you know it, the, the guy at the grocery store knows your whole life story and he knows that's not actually who you are. And very quickly found out. This is how lies become an issue. And it can get to a point, if this is your pattern, to become, uh, what's it called, the boy who cried wolf, right? So now every time you say anything, someone's going to think, well, that's probably not accurate. That's probably not right. You're probably just pulling your leg. To the point where everything you say is just either a joke or it's intentionally misconstrued. And even after you start breaking this habit and you begin to tell the truth, you're still painted as the boy who cried wolf. It takes long to, to break out of that shell because that will be initial, someone's initial reaction. We talked about what's per, someone's perception of you. This can be someone's perception of you. Whenever you say something, they go, oh, don't listen to that guy. He's just, he's just saying something. It's, it's not right. But we can't just stop lying. We have to replace that with something. And so the verse says, replace it with the opposite. Put away the falsehood. Instead, let us all speak truth to our neighbors. Instead of just not lying, and you know, the, the, the saying says, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. I think a better way of saying it, if you don't have anything good, anything good to say, think of something good to say and say that. It might take some work. It might be a challenge. You might say, there's nothing good I can say in the situation, so I'm going to say nothing. Well, that is better than saying the bad thing, but what's far better is saying a good thing. Put in the right place, in the right context, if someone is uh, offending you or cursing you or whatever it might be, it's really hard to say something good about that person in that moment, isn't it? That's really hard. And saying nothing is useful. It's far more useful than lashing out at them. But thinking of something positive to say and doing that in that moment is so much more effective. If we're genuine about it. Because it dismantles the whole thing. Like now they realize anything they're saying is, is not penetrating. And we're almost communicating to them, look, I'm in the same situation as you are, and, you, and, and there's a better way to deal with this. We can still be here. We can still talk. We can still actually respect each other, even though we don't like each other right now. And we can keep going. To replace the negative with something entirely different and, in fact, opposite. Uh, verse 26, 
talks about this here again. Another example, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Notice that it doesn't say, which oftentimes a lot of us think, don't be angry. It doesn't say that. Instead it says, do be angry, but do it well. See, anger is an emotion. Anger is a normal human emotion. You can't control your emotions, but you can control what your response is to those emotions. So be angry, but don't sin. Be angry. Don't stop trying to feel the way that you're feeling, because you're going to feel that way anyway. It's just going to be bottled up inside, and you won't know what to do with it now. Instead, feel that feeling. Be true to yourself. Why is it so important to do that? The alternative is pretending you're not angry, trying really hard not to be angry, and then eventually blowing up at someone, because you actually are angry. Growing bitter towards a person or a situation because you never really got over this thing because you never really dealt with it. See, anger is not the sin. But letting the sun go down on your anger without dealing with that emotion, that's the problem. Letting it fester, letting it grow. Becoming bitter, becoming resentful. So the way to deal with it is to simply not, is to not simply stop being angry but to replace the desire to be angry with something that we can actually do with that. So we do angry well. How do we do that? We take it to its end and then we move on. Be angry, but also forgive. Be angry at the situation, at the person, at whatever. Let it out and then forgive. Move past it. Say, I'm not going to let the sun go down on this anger. I don't want this to become a wedge in our relationship, even though I don't agree with you, even though I think this is not the right way to do it, and it's frustrating me, and I want to let you know, but at the same time, I want to love you as a brother, as a sister, and I want to forgive you because I felt offended by the way this went, or whatever it might be. Every situation regarding this will be different, but I think it's incredibly important to be honest with ourselves, with other people, and to deal with things when they come. And the same thing can be said about any emotion. It can be said about grief, right? Be honest with your grief. To allow yourself to be in, to be sad, to grieve. And then to deal with that emotion and move on. Instead of continually being in this space of just being miserable and you don't know why, and it's probably something that happened 20 years ago that you don't even remember about anymore, but it's just stuck with you. Because you let you, the sun go down on your grief and you... We're not able to wrestle with it and, and deal with it well. Uh, verse 28 <clears throat> says, Thieves must give up stealing. There's the thing you have to stop doing, that thou shalt not. And then it continues on, and it says, Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. So don't just stop stealing but remove the desire and or the opportunity to steal by keeping busy. Instead of stealing food to survive, maybe get a job so you can afford the things you need so you don't have to steal. Or maybe stealing is not a thing you're doing out of necessity, but it's just an issue you have. And you steal because you want this thing or you covet this thing. Or maybe take value in your own possessions that you have. Be honest about what you have and really focus and pay attention to what you have and, 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 and who you are. So much so that you don't even know that your, your, your neighbor bought a new car. You haven't even noticed it because you're so busy with what you have. See, we can be sitting in a place, in a situation, not really feeling like we, are, we have what we need to be adequate. And instead of saying, how can I get what I need to be adequate? How can I do that in, in a positive way? We think about all the other people out there who have all the things we wish we had. And wouldn't it be great to have those things? And then the wheels begin to spin. And if this is your tendency, you may resort to stealing to get what you think you might have to be adequate. Right? So instead of just not steal, do that, but then continue on. 
and work and do it well. And then also here we have doing the opposite, right? That thing I talked about, the replacement, is you're, you're now working an honest wage with your own hands to provide for your needs, but then it goes on and it says, so you have my, some, might have something to share with the needy. So you're intentionally doing the opposite, giving things away. Why are you doing that? Because it's so far from thievery as you could possibly get that your desire to steal is now far less than it was. Even if it's a tendency, a temptation that follows you the rest of your life, shall we say, it's your thorn in your flesh. If you intentionally work at being a, a benevolent person, thievery will be less likely to enter into your frame of reference. <clears throat> Verse 29 says, Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up and, uh, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God who, uh, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. So replace the pattern of talking poorly about people with a pattern of encouraging people. This again goes back to that thing, if you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. Maybe instead encourage the person, right? You can say, take the classic example of, you know, your wife puts on a dress and asks, does this dress make me look fat? You don't say, well, of course it does. You say, well, no, it doesn't. Well, you have to be genuine about it. You can't just say that. You actually have to be genuine about it. Or maybe if you don't have anything positive to say about the dress, you say, uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but your hair looks lovely. Right, And maybe she knows you better than that and knows you're just saying something to cover up. But anyway, probably a poor example, but you know what I'm saying, right? We have this negative thing that we want to say about someone. We see the negative pattern in their life or the thing we don't like about them, whatever, and that's the first thing we want to talk about. But instead of, oh, I'm not going to talk about that, I'm going to say nothing to them, how about we go up to them intentionally and say something positive about them? something encouraging to them, something that can travel with them. Because, yeah, everyone has things that people don't like about them. Everyone has things that, people, that, that need to be worked on. But everyone also needs encouragement. So we need to balance these things in our own lives, in other people's lives. The example I wrote down here, which is similar, is finding a really ugly person and saying, instead of telling them you're ugly, say, you're a great singer. Uh, as they say, it's not all over till the fat lady sings. So, get that out there. That was a bad joke. So, moving on. Um, verse 31. says, Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. If someone has done something to hurt us, we want to lash out at them, we want to get back at them, we want to stew on it in our bitterness and let it destroy our relationship. And telling ourselves to not be angry or not be bitter or not to take things that aren't ours or all these examples we've sort of looked at that simply is not enough. It simply does not break that negative habit. Instead, no matter how much it kills you, do something good for that person. Be kind. Be forgiving. If someone says something hurtful to you intentionally, let's say they intentionally reject your dinner invitation, show up at their house with a pie and say, I know you couldn't make it, but, you know, I just thought you might want this. Maybe if your best friend missed your birthday party and you know they were just going to someone else's party because they'd rather be over there, make sure to show up to their birthday party on time and bring a really good gift. So you know what? This, is, this doesn't have to become a thing between us. This is something that happens, and I'm going to let you know about it, and we're going to move on and work through it. See, tit for tat is not really a, a Christian concept or the saying, it's only fair. You know, you'll get what's coming to you. That's not really a mantra we should live by. Instead, we should intentionally fight against these uh, sort of temptations or these behaviors or these patterns by replacing them 
with tendencies to do the opposite. To love your enemies. To do good to those who persecute you. Not only because we want to be selfless, thinking of others before ourselves, but simply because it's actually healthy for us as well. It's not healthy to be always looking out for the things that we need to do to get back at somebody. That's not really a, a way to live that is filled with life and filled with joy and filled with gladness. It's hard to forgive, especially if you've been the victim of something. It's incredibly hard. But if you don't forgive, it's worse. I know a lady who, at a young age, she was raped by her uncle. And she traveled with this for years and years and years. She was 30-something and married, and it was still bothering her, this situation. And she wrestled through it with the counselors and with her husband and the whole thing. And finally, they said, you know what? How about you apologize to him? She's dumbfounded. Why would I apologize to him? Or not apologize. How will you forgive him? Why would I forgive him? He's done this horrible thing and he never said I'm sorry. He never even recognized it. No one even knows it happened other than me and my husband and my counselor. It's like, well, this thing is incredibly damaging you far more than you realize. And so she couldn't manage to go to him in person to forgive him uh, for many reasons, one of them being the distance factor, but also it would be probably not healthy for her in that way because of how hurtful it was. So the counselor said, just write a letter. Write a letter, find out his address, mail it out, just expressing the fact that you remember what happened and it bothers you and you just wanted to know him. let him know that you forgive him. And she says it was incredibly interesting because at every other sort of family function she went to after that, whenever she saw him, she felt like she had to go to the other side of the room. Even though probably at this point in their life, he wasn't going to do anything, right? She just felt like he still had the power over her and she couldn't do anything. She, couldn't go. she had to sort of hide beside her husband the whole time to be able to make it through this family reunion. And at the next family reunion, she showed up and she looked at him in his eyes and smiled. And he turned the other way and went to the other side of the room. Because all of a sudden he realized, I've done this horrible thing and it's been bothering her for 30 years and now it's bothering him. And she was okay with it. Because she forgave him. What incredible power forgiveness has. That we can have something and turn it around and say, this is the situation, this is the problem, this is the emotion. And instead of just not stopping to do that, let me do the opposite. Let me forgive the person who really does not deserve my forgiveness. Not just because it's good for them, but it also because it's good for me. It's good for my heart, it's good for my soul. Because if we're honest, now when we see that person, we no longer see them as the person who has uh, sort of done something wrong against me. We see them as a forgiven sinner. That's who they are in my eyes now. And who else is a forgiven sinner? I'm a forgiven sinner. And when Jesus looks at me, that's what he sees. And boy, am I glad for it. And that's where we get to chapter 5 that sort of brings this all together. It says, be imitators of God. As beloved children, live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be imitators of God. Live in love just as he loved us and gave himself up for us. That's a hard way to live. But it's a beautiful way. Jesus has this verse he says in chapter 6 of John that he sort of got up. People, people got upset when he said this. Um, as many things he said, people got upset at. But John chapter 6, 35, just a, it's a longer passage, but we're just going to read the, the, the one verse. He said to them, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
He doesn't come into the situation and say, I see all this moldy bread you happen to be eating and all this bad water you're drinking. I want you to get rid of all of that. But instead he says, come to me. I'm the bread of life. I am the well that you can drink of and never thirst again. I am filled with so much more than these other patterns you happen to be engaging in. So replace those with me. Don't just get rid of them. Yeah, I want you to do that, but how I want you to do it is to replace them with something far better, something far more rich, something far more loved. And so when we're stuck in situations, whatever they might be in our life, whatever our temptations are, whatever our bad habits are, we need to pray about those things and turn to God and say, what can I replace this with? Not, how do I stop doing this? There is a place for that. But God, show me. Show me what you can do in my life, in my heart, that I think this thing is doing that I know you can do far better. Show me how you can fill that space. Show me how you can be my new habit in this area.